Hi, my name is Rob Garrison. I'm the CEO of Mercado Labs. Welcome to the eighth edition of the First Things First podcast, where we introduce you to supply chain thought leaders from across media, venture, and industry. Last month's guest was Dan Gardner. Dan is the founder of Trade Facilitators, and he recently added co-founder of Trade Accelerators, a digital first forwarder and broker to his resume. So we want to wish Dan every success in his new endeavor, effective today. Congratulations, Dan. It was a great episode, and I hope you will check it out. Today's guest is Jim Tompkins. Uh, Jim is the founder of Tompkins Ventures, and Jim's had an amazing career in the supply chain um, industry as an entrepreneur, an educator, an author, you name it, he's done it, much more. And I know you'll enjoy hearing uh, Jim's story, so we're looking forward to that. But first, I want to congratulate Mohammed Al Dayab for being the recipient of our Episode 7 donation to the Let's Talk Supply Chain Blended Diversity Pledge. Once again, Mercado will be donating $100 to this great cause on behalf of one of today's listeners. Okay, so now let's dive into a segment that we call the Fastest Five. And be sure to stay all the way to the end after my interview with Jim Tompkins. I've got a topic today I'm going to cover called Resilience. With everything going on in the supply chain uh, industry, I thought I'd do a little bit of a monologue on resilience and kind of how to build resilience into your supply chain. So hopefully you'll stay till the end and take a listen to that. And now let's get started. So the hottest topic this week by far is the impending rail strike. And for that, I turned to Lorianne Larocco and her great analysis for, analysis for CNBC entitled, Large Railroad Labor Unions Said They Will Strike If Quality of Life Issues Aren't Addressed. So let's begin with a summary to bring you up to speed. 12 labor unions are seeking concessions from the three large railroads. And if an agreement's not reached by Friday, they could go on strike. If they do go on strike, it would have a $2 billion per day impact to the nation's economy. So it is, as they say, a big dot deal. Eight of the 12 unions have reached a tentative agreement with the railroads. However, two of the four that remain represent more than 50% of all railroad, railroad workers. So it's still far from settled. Uh, they're seeking concessions on quality of life issues, including vacation, sick days, and attendance policies and more, but those are the big three. The cooling off period for this strike expires on Friday, and union representatives are saying right now that based on the current offers they've got from the railroads, it's not enough. So there's still more work to do between now and Friday. Let's hope it ends, because in addition to the economic impact, this could sort of grind shipping to a crawl as 40 percent of all long distance trade in North America is by rail. So railroads, in fact, have already begun some emergency measures, for example, offloading hazardous cargo in the event of a shutdown. So, again, stay tuned for that. Uh, all this will either be known one way or another on Friday. In other carrier news, Richard Myline of the Financial Times reports on the potential for a hard landing in ocean freight. So these numbers are going to astound you. But Tory estimates that the ocean shipping industry made an operational profit in 2019 of seven billion. In 2019, that number had gone up to 26 billion. In last year, uh, it went up to 210 billion. The projected profit for this year from the ocean carriers is 270 billion dollars. And to put that in perspective, that profit in the last four years is more than the carriers had made in the last six decades combined. So huge numbers. So now the question is. Can they continue on that streak making great profits or are they in for a hard landing? And so I'm going to give you both sides of the story. It, uh, working against them are economic headwinds around the world, essentially. You, you can, kind of can't look at an economy and see a headwind um, somewhere. Also, there's cooling demand for consumer products and carriers themselves are having capacity increases projected by Alpha Liner to be 28 percent in the coming year. On the other hand, carriers have become more adept at alliances, capacity reductions. Um, some are investing in brand new businesses to keep the, the parade going. For example, Maersk invested $3.4 billion buying Lee and Fung Logistics. So we'll see if they take a hard landing, a soft landing, or where it goes. But for sure, the profits have been phenomenal. Okay, so last uh, segment before I bring Jim, Jim on here, I just want to talk about China a little bit. When we talk about economic headwinds, China's a good case study. So China's economy is suffering as uh, growth challenges pile up, according to Jason Douglas of the Wall Street Journal. A severe real estate crisis coupled with uh, fading demand for its exports are creating dark economic clouds for sure in China. And more recently, severe droughts and continued COVID lockdowns are depressing domestic consumption. 
So China's economy grew just 0.4% in the second quarter and is expected to go 2.7% for the year, down from 8.1% last year. So one example of many around the world where economies are cooling quickly. Okay, so with that, I'd like to bring on my guest, uh, Jim Tompkins. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rob. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, before we get started, I want to congratulate you. Jim just wrote a new book. It's called Insightful Leadership. I had a chance to read it. It's an excellent read. I encourage everyone to read it. In fact, if you look at the show notes, we're going to give away 15 free copies on today's show. So look in the notes for how to get a copy of this. It's a great read. Congratulations on this, by the way, Jim. Thank you. So, Jim, let's get started, uh, if we could. I, I, I thought maybe for the listener's benefit, if you don't mind, you've had a really storied career in supply chain. And I, I hope you wouldn't mind kind of walking us through, you know, as far back as you want to. But how did you get started in this crazy business? And what have you been doing since? Well, Rob, uh, I, I, I will get to that. Let me touch on the, the rail strike. You know, Union Pacific, BNSF, uh, CSX, and Norfolk Southern is a big, big, big deal and uh, two billion. But I also uh, think we should point out the UK rail strike that's happening at the end of this month. So there's uh, there's lots of difficulty, uh, not to mention the uh, ILWU uh, on the West Coast. So yeah, <laughs> labor issues are, are huge. And uh, that's one of the reasons I got into this career because uh, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity for continuous uh, learning and continuously developing. I mean, it's such a broad field. Um, I began um, this pursuit of uh, my career at uh, Purdue University. I um, got my bachelor's degree there with a, uh, a, a kind of a thought process of getting into the logistics, uh, physical distribution space. We didn't have the word supply chain back then. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I got convinced to go after a master's degree, and I found that I doubled my educational value by getting my master's degree, and that stung me to pursue new knowledge about uh, physical distribution and materials management, and so I stayed on for my PhD. So the foundation of my career is a industrial engineering degrees from Purdue University. Interesting enough, then Dr. Tompkins had an opportunity to become <laughs> private Tompkins. I was uh, drafted a total of 14 times, and the 14th time they got me, they said, you will come now, and I said, what are my options? And they said, well, you can go to Canada, you can commit suicide, you can go to jail, um, or you can enlist for three years, and we'll give you three months delayed entry. So I got three months delayed entry, finished my PhD, went into basic training, did my thing. They offered me a, a officer candidate school, but I would have to have an additional six months. And I said, gentlemen, I'm going to give you three years. I will dedicate myself to the U.S. Army, but it's not three years in a day. So I will stay a private. Thank you very much. Interestingly, the Army did a great job of utilizing me. And in fact, for uh, two years and nine months, I was in New Jersey, basically running the city called Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And I had uh, 400 tradesmen. I had about $11 million worth of inventory. And what my job was is to maintain the city called Fort Monmouth. And so we got to get the right material, the right people, the right equipment to fix this new hot water heater, that this broken hot water heater, or repair this roof that didn't work. And so it was a great job. And I got to use a lot of my education. And it was a great experience. I left there, went to North Carolina State University, where I would desired to pursue a career um, in supply chain and uh, began teaching uh, facilities planning, material handling, transportation, network design. And um, I realized that the, the university didn't pay as well as I thought they would. And so I started doing a little consulting on the side. Four years later, my wife said to me, she said, do you know that your part-time income is six times larger than your full-time income? <laughs> And I said, well, no, I hadn't really looked at that. And and so she said, well, maybe you ought to think about that. So then to be clear, Rob, I made the decision. My wife did not tell me to quit the university. And, <laughs> and that's my story. And I'm going to stick with it. But, uh, but uh, I did leave the university and went with the, the little consulting firm I started called Tomkins International by um, year 2020. That had grown into a 300 person uh, uh, 
almost $200 million firm, and the business was great, but COVID hit. And so after 47 years at Tompkins International, I quit and uh, decided I wanted to go into business that dealt more with the, the global problems and I wanted to deal with scale. And so I followed the, the network effect. I'm a big fan of Jeff Bezos and Jeff yeah. Bezos had been preaching network effect, network effect. And so I said, I want to do the network effect. And so what I've done, I've now created at Tompkins Ventures, a network of expertise that allows us to address a wide range of supply chain problems. We work in facilities, we work with capital, we work with logistics, we work with technology, and we work with leadership. And these are the five core functions of a business. And we bring these five core things to business and we solve problems and we find people that have problems. We have people have solutions and we put them together. And so we are a matchmaking global network of solutions that allows us to help companies. And that's what Tompkins Ventures is. And um, we are really, really, really doing well. If I had any idea it would have worked this well, I would have started it earlier. But I really <laughs> love what I'm doing. And uh, we're bringing about a lot of success for a lot of folks around the world. So it's cool. Very cool. Yeah. And Jim, as a, as a beneficiary of that matchmaking service, I agree. It's phenomenal what you're doing. And we'll put notes in the show in terms of how they can reach out to you if anyone's in need of those services. Jim and his team do a phenomenal job. And Jim, I think, knows or at least knows or is in second degree separation from anybody who's anybody in this business. So if he doesn't know it, he'll know somebody who does. Um, so, Jim, I, so let me just start by, you know, you've seen this supply chain industry over your 40 plus years from academia all the way through to consulting and now to Tompkins Ventures. What trend in supply chain are you most excited about or encouraged by now? You know, fast forward to 2022. What are you thinking about in terms of what's next on the horizon? Well, I think one of the things I'm most encouraged about is our positioning in supply chain. Um, right on the other side of this camera on my computer, there's a chair and in March of 2020, my wife came in to this office and sat down. And I thought, oh, wow, what did I do wrong now? I mean, my <laughs> wife never comes in here and sits down. And I thought, I, you know, did I forget to take the trash out? Did I forget to buy, knock down the Amazon boxes? And, and then she smiles. And I said, oh, wow, maybe I'm not in trouble. And she says, congratulations. I said, well, thank you. I said, why are you give me congratulations? She said, because you are now legitimate. I thought, wow, mom and dad <laughs> never told me. I, 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 I've always thought I was legitimate. I said, what do you mean? She said, we've been married. This was two years ago. She said, we've been married 52 years. And for 52 years, I've had to explain to your friends, to my friends, to our friends, to our kids, to our grandkids, what it is you do. And no one has a clue. She said, but now Marie called me yesterday and Marie said, Marie's my wife's best friend. She said, and Marie said, I was just listening to those and they're talking about supply chain. Isn't that what Jim does? And my wife said, yes. And so I, all of a sudden, our profession of a supply chain is, I mean, like we've been, you know, singing for 52 years in some little bar. And now all of a sudden, you know, we're Elvis Presley and the Beatles combined. And so supply chain <laughs> is hot. So that's one thing I like is that we really now we're, we're, we're now dealing at the board level and making really key, key, key impacts. Another trend is this whole thing towards digitization and how we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to create autonomous supply chain. And that's really, really, really cool um, for us to be looking at making smart warehouses, for us to making smart fulfillment centers, and for us to be able to um, create an environment that we can deal with uncertainty. And I think that's probably another trend that I see is that we now really understand that the new normal is disruption. You know, that's the basis of the book. The basis of the book is you cannot just sit back and do what we've done. You, you can't just have a strategy, a vision, a budget, a staff and execute because the fact of the matter is things are changing very rapidly. And so dealing with uncertainty, which is the new normal, which is reality, is something I'm really excited about because it changes a lot of the paradigms. In fact, about 90% of what I knew in 2019 is irrelevant. 
And so we've had to relearn. And so we have a new profession that's respected, that really is getting engaged at the front level of digitization. And we have opportunities to reinvent how supply chain works. So it's, it's a cool time to be doing what we're doing. So I want to ask you about digitization in a second, but I just a funny thing when you're talking about supply chain being a thing, I saw a meme and it was a girl on the cover and she said, I haven't been able to get a date in six months, supply chain issues. <laughs> so you, yeah, it was my fault. I did it. My wife blamed me for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we become a thing when we've got memes uh, that supply chain is responsible for dating woes. Um, so. Jimmy, talk about all these, you know, disruptions are the new norm, uncertainty is the new norm. And in your view, digitization is the key towards addressing this new norm. How does that work? You, you, you mentioned a couple of tools like machine learning and artificial intelligence. But fundamentally, when a company's thinking about all the things you mentioned, their strategy, their budget, their sales forecast, all the normal things they do in their organization, how do they think about digitization as sort of a cornerstone to that strategy to make sure they can keep track of or and or respond quickly to all of these disruptions going on in the world. How do we connect those two things? Well, the challenge we've had is we've been trained to think about our link. And in fact, we're really, most supply chain people don't do a chain. What they do is their link. And so they, how can I optimize my link to make sure that I'm doing my job better? But the fact of the matter is, in these uncertain times, your link is dependent upon the link before you, the link before that, the link before you, and your performance is based upon the link after you, link after you, link after you. So, in fact, I don't even like the concept of a chain anymore. I prefer to think about it as a network. And as a digital supply network, what I want to have is I want to have real-time information from the raw material all the way through the manufacturing process, all the way through the distribution process, all the way up to the ultimate consumer. And in that way, what I can do is I can eliminate two words that have been associated but separate, and those two words are planning and execution. The fact of the matter is, in today's uncertain world, if you have planning and execution, you're not gonna be able to be successful. I like to take the and out of that sentence, and I have one word, and there's no dash, there's no hyphen, the word is planning execution. That's one thing. And planning execution in a real time mode, replans, re execute, replans, re execute in real time on the fly because I know everything from end to end. And if I have that visibility and traceability, I now can control all the way from raw, all the way to the front porch when it gets delivered. And now I have the ability of reducing cost, improving performance, and having the product delivered when we promise, fulfilling the customer promise. That's what the digitization allows us to do that we never could do before. Amazing summary. I have two, two points to make. One, I've got a, a question from an audience member that I want to run by you for, from Alejandra. But before I do that, I, I read an interesting quote. You talk about a supply chain network as opposed to a link, right? And I think that's a critical distinction. I heard someone call it a, uh, if you think of a chain link fence, right? And you've got all these different nodes, but they're all connected to build this fence. I thought that was an interesting analogy as well. So uh, supply chain network, supply chain link fence, whatever we're calling it this day, don't do nodes. I think that's the key point. Um, Alexandra is asking this question, Jim, what would be your biggest concern you have about digitization? So you're talking about all the benefits do you also have concerns? Are there any things that, that people should worry about when they're thinking about their digital journey? Yeah, my, my biggest concern is that people believe that it's still 2019. <laughs> and they believe that the things, I mean, here's, you know, in, in the book, the, the end of the book, what I say is here's a guy named Charlie. He's been working for 38 years. He's now the chief supply chain officer of a major company. And his problem is, he believes that what he's done for the last 38 years is relevant. And he doesn't throw that out and restart. Um, I, I'm a PhD industrial engineer. So what do PhD engin industrial engineers? They optimize things. Guess what? Optimization ain't what it used to be because of the level of uncertainty. What I want to do is I want to optionize and I want to do optionization. How can I optionize these solutions so that if this happens, I can do this. If this happens, I can do this. If this happens, I can do this. If I optimize and it doesn't happen, then I'm in deep, deep, deep doo-doo. 
So I think the thing that concerns me the most is that companies are not thinking anew. They're waiting for what they do do to become relevant again, and that's not going to be that's not going to be successful. Your supply chain will fail, and therefore you will fail. And so I, I really encourage people get off the get off the beach, get in the water, make something happen. <laughs> I want to uh, cite another example from your book that I thought was really interesting is. A CEO asking the COO why they couldn't make more refrigerators or, you know, make them in Iowa. Why can't we make more of them? And the punchline of the story is that we can't get enough compressors. Well, they're made in Brazil. Why can't we get enough compressors? Well, the parts for the compressors are coming from China. So this digitization flows all over the place. You need to, to your point, from raw materials all the way through, have the data available so that you can, A, comprehend your supply chain. Then to your point, I'm going to call it optionalize it. Oh, to use your word. So uh, thank you for that. And hopefully that addressed your question, Alejandro. I also wanted to just give a shout out to Muhammad, who talked about the, the key takeaway that you gave, which is change is now constant. And so just you got to be prepared for it. You have to digitize. So on yeah. that note, um, see two ways I can go with this. It, I'll give you both questions and, and you decide which one you want to address. We've got about four minutes left, um, Jim. So either what advice would you give to a person starting in supply chain today? Someone just starting out the career. We have a lot of uh, students and young listeners and or uh, you could take it from what do you love about supply chain the most or the opposite, which is if you had a magic wand, what's the one thing you would change? So either one of those questions, we can riff off of that for the remaining minutes. OK, let me try to give a quick answer to both. Um, the one with respect to um, somebody who's starting out. You got to get broad and you got to get deep. OK, that's what makes supply chain so much fun. If you don't have the breadth, you need to understand plan, buy, make, move, store, sell. You got to understand the mega processes. But then what you got to do is you got to dig down deep into each one of those. So when we say move, that's transportation. You got to know ocean. You got to know truck. You got to know less than truck. You got to know parcel. You got to know final mile. You got to have first mile, middle mile, last mile. And so it's really, really about breadth and depth. So get a variety of experiences. Don't do the same job for five years. Now, I'm not saying leave your company, but get yourself in a different position so you get more breadth and more depth of experience. That's really, really, really critical. Um, on the other issue about um, what is the the thing that, that I want to you know eliminate the most, I already answered that. That is the people who are not thinking anew. This is a time for innovation. This is a time for entrepreneurship. This is a time for creating major change. And so what we need to do is we need to think big, make things happen. Okay, so we got a few minutes left. I'm gonna maybe leverage your knowledge for my last topic. When you get off, I'm gonna talk a little bit about resilience. So when when you, in fact, you dedicated a chapter in your book to resilience. I really loved it, chapter nine, for those of you who wanna read it. But how do you think about resilience, Jim? You talked at the front end about all of this constant change and putting in digitization so that you're better prepared for it. So you come up with this word called resilience. You want to build a more resilient supply chain. What does that mean in the end? What does it mean that when I've succeeded with all the recommendations you've gotten, that I can, I can claim to my board that I've got a more resilient supply chain? And here's how. Here's how I have evidence that I've got a more resilient supply chain. What are the things that we're trying to address there? Well, the, the topic of resilience, uh, if we look at the mechanical en in mechanical engineering definition of resilience, resilience is the ability to bounce. And so if I drop a ball and it falls on the floor and goes splat, it has resilience of zero. If I drop a ball from this height and it bounces right back up and hits my hand, that has a resilience of 1.0. That's marvelous. And so what we need to understand is what we need to build is some digital supply networks that have the ability to bounce. So although the things that are happening weren't expected, we can deal with them and still get the product delivered on time. That's what resilience is about, is fulfilling the customer promise, promise even though it really hit the fan and it's not easy, but we're going to make it happen. Fantastic. Great summary, Jim. I, I, this 25 minutes went by way too fast, but I want to thank you immensely for sharing your knowledge with this audience. Uh, again, for those of you uh, listening to this call or dialing in, we'll be handing out 15 uh, copies of Jim's excellent book, Insightful Leadership, where you get what you just got in 20 minutes, plus a lot more and great stories. He's a great storyteller. And then we'll also put how to reach Jim. If you've got any questions, um, we'll, we'll put a, a contact in his organization that you can reach out to for additional insights. 
So Jim, thank you immensely for your time. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think we need to find a longer, 25 minutes is not nearly enough. <laughs> thank you, Rob, I enjoyed being with you. Thanks, Jim, have a great day. Bye-bye Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was the great Jim Tompkins and hopefully you enjoyed that as much as I did. I, I, I never uh, ceased to have an amazement at Jim's breadth and depth of knowledge. So hope you enjoyed that as well. So I'm going to close this out on the last topic, which is resilience. And, and it, it just ties off of what I learned from Jim and what I learned from the book, the book. If you're in the supply chain industry right now, you've never been in a crazier time. So Jim said it, and I'm just going to reiterate it a little bit. I haven't been doing this quite as long as Jim, but close, I, over more than 30 years now. And I would say if I took the first 25 years of my career combined, we didn't have the level of complexity and challenges that we've had in the last five years. And the challenges come from all over the place. There's global economic issues that we hadn't had in quite a while. The, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the potential conflicts between China and Taiwan, the geopolitical issues. You've had a lot of economic crises. We've had infrastructure challenges. It's been amazingly challenging. And so just my closing thought is, you know, how can you address it? Jim gave some good thoughts in making sure you've got resilience and you've got a ball that can bounce back. And digitization is being uh, one way to do that. I'm going to take it one step further because I focus on one segment of the supply chain, the international supply chain. And I'm going to add two more things to digitization that I think companies need to think about. Digitization is primary. You've got to have some way to connect all of these things in this chain link fence or, or whatever it is that you want to describe it as a, a network, a chain link fence, however you want to describe it. But you also have to wait to have, have a way to be able to connect all of the different people that come together in a supply chain. We don't talk about enough as Jim's talking about these silos, but for an international order, at least there's up to nine different business entities that have to come together to complete a purchase order. There's up to nine different departments that a company have to come together, up to 35 people touch an order. And so how do you get all of those business entities? How do you get all of those departments? How do you get all of those people on exactly the same page? And so uh, platforms, applications, anything you want to look at that does that, that's purpose built for that, we'll get everybody on the same page. So that's to digitize, then connect. And the last thing that I, I sort of prescribe is methods. And when you look at the international supply chain, not only are those links independent, each department has their methods to optimize their link. There's not methods that go across there. So how do I measure the real effectiveness of supply chain? It really should be from the moment I place an order to the moment I have it available for sale. So I could optimize my link if I'm in logistics and I can say I can get it here faster. But if by optimizing my link, I lost out on an opportunity to get it to a place faster instead of looking at it, how can I get it to the consumer faster? Maybe I should have stopped at the West Coast and delivered it directly because most of the demand was on the West Coast. Then I've lost the thread of getting that order from placement to deliver to customer. That's really the only metric that matters at the end of the day. And so you need methods that run across the supply chain, not just for each individual link. Certainly each department needs to do their thing and do it well and hold their budgets. But unless you've got that bigger, broader picture, you're going to sub-optimize costs and you're going to sub-optimize sales. So again, we talk about resilience. Everything Jim said is right. Read his book. It's excellent. I also think a lot about his bouncing ball analogy. But I would just suggest that the three things that are absolutely mandatory to build a transparent, efficient, and timely supply chain are digitization, connectivity, and then methods. And once you have those strings in place, you can certainly build a really kick-ass supply chain that's highly resilient as well. All right, everybody, thank you very much for your time, and I've enjoyed it, as always. And uh, next month, we've got another great guest coming, Eric Johnson, who is the uh, editor for JLC. And Eric is the guru when it comes to supply chain technology, so I know you'll enjoy listening to him. And I look forward to that uh, next episode, second Tuesday of every month. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.